So welcome to um, our series today. Um, we are doing introduction to text analysis. Um, and I'm going to just talk really quickly uh, as I get into our slideshow um, about sort of what the whole series is going to be this semester. Um, we have a new day and time. Uh, so we will be here on Thursdays from 4 to 5.15. Um, and we have all of these. Actually, David, do you want to offer? Um, you don't have to take them, but but they do have superheroes on them. Um, so we have these nifty postcards. <laughs> uh, we are part of the Supercomputing for Everyone series. Um, I almost showed up in my Supercomputing for Everyone t-shirt with my cloth poster from my latest conference as my cape. And maybe if you keep coming and you ask for it, I'll do it um, <laughs> as the absolute nerd that I am. Um, so. If you want to follow along today, you're going to need an account on Carbonate, and we'll come back to this slide, but it, this is the link. You could also just Google IU Carbonate Create Account um, if you don't have one already. Um, if you want to add, and then when you want to access Research Desktop, um, you're going to need to install the ThinLink client, but we're going to go through that with you. Um, and then the slides for this presentation are here. And I'll just leave that up for a hot second. And if you're having trouble creating a Carbonate account, just let me know. Because I noticed the other day, like it was not created. Just I think it's under, if you go to one.iu.edu, there's create additional accounts is like the widget, right? And that new way that they have us navigate everything. So here again are all of the things that we're going to be doing this semester. This is a basic introduction to text analysis, but um, even though the visualizations we'll be showing you today are basic, um, they, it actually reveals some of the pitfalls that accompany text analysis. And it's one of the reasons that it's good to understand what's going on in your code. Um, even when you're doing something like counting frequency, and then just visualizing it as a word cloud. Um, so that by the time you get to something like topic modeling, um, which is next week, where the math is super complicated, and you're probably not going to be able to debug the math, but you should know about some initial settings and whatever tool you're using, you can then think about, what is this topic modeling doing? Is it doing what I, you know, are the results what I expected? If they're not, is it because something awesome has kind of happened, and it's revealing something about the text, and I'm like, ooh. Or is it because I've done something in the pre-cleaning of the text that has like skewed my results? Um, then we're going to talk about sentiment analysis on the 31st. Um, sentiment analysis is often used, for, it's most useful for, for um, social media, media data. Um, we were really lucky this summer. We got to work with two undergraduates, um, David Closer, my colleague and I, um, with these two undergraduates on a, a project about North Korea. Um, and we basically track tweets over the course of a year and a half. And obviously we know that our current president has said many inflammatory things, um, like from calling Kim Jong-un a little rocket man, to being like, oh, I really respect him and he's super awesome. And so you can basically track these trends, right, based on some of the things that he's saying about him. And so we have this really interesting sentiment graph. And we also compared some of the algorithms that were being used for sentiment analysis. And um, one of the things that we've discovered uh, just across the board is that the word supremacy was rated as a positive word. Because if you think about Taco Bell, right, and Nacho Supreme, you're like, those are great. I really want some Nacho Supreme. But in English, at least, the word supremacy, especially when paired with white, right, if you're doing engrams, that's not a good thing. And a lot of the out-of-the-box sentiment analysis tools out there don't take that into account, which is terrible. Um, then we're going to talk about document similarity on the 7th. Um, we're going to be doing latent semantic analysis. And there's a couple ways that this can work. It can tell you about documents in your corpus that are most similar to each other. And again, that can surface some really interesting things that you might not have picked up on. Um, and then it can also talk to you about words in a corpus that are most associated with another word. And so again, you may think that like you have a good understanding. So for me, um, I'm an early modernist, 
And I think I know how Shakespeare uses a certain term. And maybe it shows up with something I didn't expect at all. And then I want to go back and look at why that's happening. And then finally, on the 14th, we're doing something brand new, which is we're going to be here, and you can come ask us any questions you want, and we'll help you run any projects you want or get started. It's sort of just an open thing. We'll probably have cookies and like stuff like that. Um, and then we sort of have a little intermediary section here where we talk about um, some of – it relates to the second half of the semester, but we have some visiting speakers. Um, so Rome Reborn is about visiting Rome in AD 320 um, via virtual reality. Um, and it's a project that's been going on for 10 years, um, and it's really interesting. And Bernie Fisher will be presenting that. On the 28th, we'll have virtual reality in the art history classroom, as presented by Matt Brennan. He'll be talking about some Italian frescoes um, that he presented on recently. And then finally, we're going to have Margaret Delinsky, who's a fine artist here, talking about painting virtual art and artist's history through VR. And a lot of her installations are also VR-based. Um, and then we ourselves will have a talk about augmented reality and virtual reality and sort of the tools available to you and ways that we can help you do that. Um, then we're going to be talking about um, an introduction to 3D digitization, which is one of the other things my group does. Um, so you know, when you have ye oldy iPhone, right, and you want to like preserve it in 3D, then you can make a 3D model of it. Um, and then finally, on the 11th, um, Matt Mercer and I will be talking about creating a virtual tour. We did this with, in cooperation with the Indiana um, Geological Society and Water Survey something something to create a virtual limestone tour, um, which is something that, you, that people on campus take all the time, but we wanted to make it available for people who can't come to campus. Um, and then on the 18th, I'll have to add this back in, we're going to have, again, another sort of like extravaganza day where you could play with the 3D scanner or you could put on a headset um, or things like that. Um, so, okay, that's enough from me. Hello, my name is David. Um, I work with Takashi at CyberDH and uh, this is just the outline of our presentation today. Um, so, First, we've got some setting up we need to do in order to be able to access the notebooks and the data. Um, and then uh, once we kind of get that paired away, then Tash is going to come back and talk to you a bit more about what exactly is text analysis, what's it good for, um, and then we'll start uh, making some cool visualizations, word clouds, and stream graphs and things. So, all right. So you need FinLink client to access Research Desktop. Uh, to do that, uh, find a little. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it was. It's always small, and I can't see it. I see it now, but now I can't see the mouse. There we go. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So this takes us to the knowledge base, which is going to describe what all you need to do in order to install. Uh, and first, in order to even get it, you uh, wear and download it there. They have a link. Um, and generally, then once you've clicked on that link in IU wear, as usual, there's you know directions and things like that. Uh, little pop-ups that tell you where to go from there. So I'm going to right now just give everybody a minute or two to get that process started. How many people are actually following? You. Okay. All right. So do you still need a minute? It's okay if you... So the, the knowledge base directions are pretty thorough, um, and yeah, uh, don't worry about that. You're yeah, um, you're basically just going to be downloading it, launching it, and you're going to make some adjustments. Um, in on here is the most important one. 
when you open it. So you'll want to, when you get this little box that's right up here in the top, you're going to click on that options button and that's going to lead you to this. And you're going to want to click on the screen tab there, which is going to bring this up. And so you want to click current monitor and make sure these two boxes in red are unchecked. So you want them unchecked. They probably will have checks on them. Get rid of them. And once you're there, or show it again. This one? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Forget I'm sitting right next to it. No, I can't see. It's a little bit bigger. Yeah. No, and. No, Uh, okay. All right. There we go. There we go. There we go. So now let's just. There we go. Drag it. Right that one. There we go. Okay. Okay. Is that better? All right. All right. I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when you when you log in and the. Uh, um. Here we go. I am going to now. Minimize this. I just saw. Okay, that mouse needs to be bigger and not white. Okay. Minimize. All right. Okay. So. So the nice thing about Research Desktop, it does use Carbonate, which is the, one of the supercomputers here at IU. Uh, so it gives you quite a bit of computing power. So if you happen to be using a very large corpus or collection, uh, it'll help your poor little laptop give it a break um, and let uh, the supercomputer do the work for you. Uh, and the nice thing too about using research desktop is since it's not on your actual laptop it's uh, you know being processed in a server you can start a process and then you can actually close your laptop and walk away and it's still going to keep working on it because it's not doing it on your laptop it's doing it over here so that is a nice thing because i've started things before i leave work and then and it's it's done and ready to go so uh, the other nice thing about Research Desk is it does have both and our studio already pre-installed, so you don't have to then go through the you know downloading Anaconda or any of that stuff, and um, it's just it's right there, ready to use. Are we ready? Our yeah. studio is an IDE used for R, uh, which is a statistical programming language. It was created by statisticians. It's based off of S which was created in the 1976. Yeah, and so in R actually is because the creators, and I think that comes up later, a little bit of the history of that. Um, the creator's first name started with R, so they were both, since it was based off of S, so like we'll call it R, R names start with R, so hey. Um, but it's... Yeah. 
yeah, R and Python do that. Usually, like Jupyter, that's why it's called a PY instead of, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the stuff we're going to use is going to be both in Python and R. Um, and that's the nice thing we're going to talk. We're going to be using Jupyter Notebooks. And the nice thing about Jupyter Notebooks is when it initially started, it was an IPython notebook because it only used Python, but it's expanded since then. And it actually now includes multiple languages. You just have to download a kernel. Um, and then the other th good thing about Research Desktop is they've already attached the R kernel to the Jupyter Notebooks, so you don't have to do that either. Um, so you can actually use the Jupyter Notebooks for both Python and R coding. Um, uh, it actually also allows, as you can see in our example pictures off to the side here, for some pretty detailed annotation. You can explain more of your code, uh, which then leads to the next point, makes it a great pedagogical tool because you can use it as a training for students, um, for new employees, for um, people on the internet who just want to learn, um, whichever, whatever floats your boat. But it's also sophisticated enough for experienced coders as well. I know there are people at UITS that code that use Python notebooks as part of it. Um, and uh, it works great for them. I don't hear any, any complaints. So it's uh, it's a really good tool, and that's why we're going to be using it today because it, it'll be um, helpful in uh, teaching you guys how to start using text analysis. So, um, like we said, we're using Python and R um, to give you a little bit. Python was created by Guido van Rossum and was first released in 1991. Actually, it's named after Monty Python and Flying Circus, not this big giant snake, um, even though that's the symbol is the snake for it, but it was actually, he was a big Monty Python fan, and that's why he named it Python. Um, it's very beginner friendly, because if, when you'll, and you'll see when we pull some up, it reads almost like English. A lot of the functions and the things that it does, it kind of spells out exactly what it's doing. So that is very helpful if you're just learning. Um, it's versatile. People use it for text analysis, data mining and visualization, machine learning. Um, which includes stuff like topic modeling that we're going to be doing because that uses a type of machine learning. So um, it's it's very, uh, very handy. And it makes use of packages, which as you'll see later, R also does. And what the packages and uh, modules are is basically somebody has gone and created um, a set of code and a set of functions and things like that that do a specific thing. Usually they all focus on a specific uh, area of expertise. So something like uh, there's one that's really popular called pandas, which actually uses a lot of uh, creating different tables and data frames. Uh, so it helps you in organizing your data and your your text. Uh, another one called numpy, which is used for doing math, creating arrays and things like that. Um, and so people create these, you just import them. Uh, for R, uh, again, I told you earlier, it's an impl implementation of S programming language, which is a statistical language. It was created by see, Ross and Robert, so R, Ross Ihaka and Robert Gentleman at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. So thank you, New Zealand. Uh, and it's also extensible through the use of packages. Um, again, initially intended for statistics, but uh, we're using it for text analysis. Uh, humanists are really good at finding things other people have done and incorporating it and using it for ourselves and just tweaking it and changing it a bit to suit our purposes. Uh, so that's what has happened here. And because of that, there's all sorts of packages now like TM, which stands for text mining. Um, there's topic modeling packages. There's all sorts of things now that by, by humanists. So, and as you're going to find, uh, the, one of the big differences between Python and R, Python is a bit, I, I guess you could say wordy in its programming. It tends to be longer uh, to kind of get the same thing done as far as what you're actually typing out. But like I said, it's more readable. Whereas R, um, when you first look at it, it's kind of hard to tell what it's doing, but it's definitely shorter and more concise. So um, that's why you have some people like one, some people prefer the other. Um, me, I don't know that I really have a favorite, just whatever does what I need to best. Um, so I think Tash has already been working on this, trying to make you guys collaborators. Uh, we have a link in box that you guys can pull in some of our notebooks. 
and some of our data sets, uh, one of which is actually uh, we have the entire series of Star Trek Next Generation, the script that they used for the show, and we've cleaned it so speaker names are removed and you know stage directions and all that. So it's just the spoken words um, that they use on, on the show. So uh, we can have a little fun with that later. So yeah, raise your hand if you're. Yeah. Anybody at home following along that? We need to put your username um, in our invitation to collaborate on the folder. So if you could type it into the, the chat so that we can get that and add you and we'll send it your way. Give it another few seconds here. People are typing. Okay. So making you a collaborator, collaborator what that's going to do is this should actually now, this folder should just be in your box folders, collection of box folders now. So you shouldn't have to like download it or anything like that. Um, if you try to access it just through the link right there, uh, then you would have to download it. Um, but uh, right now, making you a collaborator then uh, and you accept that, once you do that, it actually puts that in your collection of box folders. So uh, you should be able to access it. And one of the other nice things about Research Desktop is they now have a means of you being able to access your box account as a folder on the desktop. Um, there is a short little setup at the, the first time you, you click on it, but then after that, um, all you have to do is double click on a, a box setup thing and it'll um, instantly load it onto your, uh, your research desktop right there. Um, so everybody, we're good? Free to move on, yeah, okay. Everybody on online, good to go? Yeah, okay. Um, so now we need to open ThinLink Client, which the looks like this little guy on the top left. Your icon should look like that, um, depending on where you downloaded that to on your uh, computer. You're just going to double click it and it should open and open to the middle box right there. And so if you haven't already, like I said before, you need to set it up. So you need to go to Options. You need to click screen and then make sure those two bottom check marks are unchecked and that you have the radio that is by the current monitor. Um, and then make sure where it says server, that is exactly what you should have typed in if you want to access Research Desktop. That's the server address to get to Research Desktop. Your username, that's mine. But you don't know my passphrase, so. Huh. Um, so type in your username and your IU passphrase, and then once you hit enter or connect, you're going to now you know the duo authentication. So if you have yours pushed to your phone, or you have one of those wonderful little clicker things that they handed out, or whatever means you, or you have a fancy Apple Watch, um, uh, click. Choose number one for duo push, unless you want a phone call or a text message. Um, so you're going to choose either one, two, or three. You just type in one, hit enter, two, hit enter, three, hit enter, and it'll send that. And then you should be able to uh, just start loading Research Desktop up. Looks like. So, well, roughly. I've, I used mine, and I 
forgotten I'd pin things that aren't there. So like Jupyter Notebook and our studio are not automatically pinned uh, to your desktop. I've put them there, um, but I'm going to show you how to actually get to them in a minute. However, first we are going to get your box set up. So you go up here to the top left, where it says applications. You're going to go to storage. You're going to click on box setup. And then once you do that, it's going to lead you through a process where you are going to sign into Box and authenticate like you would normally do um, to access Box. So you're going to put in your IU username, your passphrase. Nice thing is you only have to do this once. And then after that, you can go here. And when you click Box Setup, it won't make you sign in or anything again. It'll just automatically load it onto the desktop for you. And uh, it'll be in a folder right there. And you'll just it'll say box. You'll just double click it, um, and it'll give you access to your box account. So once you do that, um, go into that text analysis folder that we gave you guys access to, and you should see all of these lovely folders right here that you're seeing on the screen. The one you want for today is intro text analysis. And the reason you want that is because if you try to load any of the others, you're going to be here for about 45 minutes loading all of them. It's mostly because of that data file right there, because we have a whole lot of other data stuff in there. Um, a lot of different, uh, we have some tweets that are quite significant, I think about 150,000 tweets. Hmm? Yeah, and make sure when you drag it, so you're going to open your box folder, find that, and you're going to drag it and put it in your home directory on Research Desktop, which should just have your username. It should say, um, so for me, Closteta's home. Yeah. So this one here, you see how it has my username, home. You're going to want to put it right there because that is your Carbonate home directory. So you're going to move that folder, put it right in there. And part of the reason we're doing this is because the notebooks and all that are set up right now to pull that exact folder from that directory. So the only thing you're going to have to go in and change in some of the code is actually your, um, you have to put your username in place of mine. Um, and that's just in the Python code. The R code, the way it works is nice. It allows you to use um, relative paths. So you can just use the tilde to signify your home directory. And so then all you have to do is um, run it. So the R code should just run without you changing anything at this point. The Python code, you'll have to go in and just find where it says close data and just add your username instead. And then that should run um, for the different file paths. But we'll get to that. OK, so now to open up Jupyter Notebook, you're going to go back up to that Applications tab. You're going to hit Analytics. And the nice thing is, it is the first one on the top. And you're just going to double click it, and it should pop open and look something like this. Yeah. So I'll wait for a minute because it's. Go ahead and move on. Um, so I'm going to take over. The microphone. Um, so um, the reason that I'm saying it's probably going to take a couple of minutes is for me, it was taking anywhere from um, four to five minutes to load that box folder. So I know that that's probably going to be doesn't like me, but I don't want to hold it. I really don't. There we go. OK. So, and now for something completely different with how we continue in this vein. And if you don't know Monty Python because you're a youngin, you should totally go check it out. Um, I met John Cleese in a Borders, which is also dating me, um, <laughs> in Santa Barbara. I was wearing my pajama bottoms. He was wearing a bathrobe and cowboy boots. So we're clearly best friends. Um, anyway. So what is text analysis? Why do you want to do it? I'm assuming you all have some interest if you're here. Um, anybody have a specific interest or that they want to like shout out or? No, we're all feeling shy. Um, so 
it's always been something, right, that people who study the humanities do, right? We, we do text analysis if we read books and we assimilate knowledge. Um, it's just only lately that computation has been this other way to sort of facilitate discovery. Um, so there have been, I, one of the things that I like to point out, um, so again, I'm an early modernist, which means my specialty is the 17th century. Um, and people have had Shakespeare concordances since like the late 17th century, right? They went through and they counted all the uses of a word in Shakespeare's corpus. So yes, it was time stake, um, it took a lot of time, right? But they knew pretty early on those kinds of things and they've been available to scholars for a long, long time. Um, so we're looking at meaning and how people build meaning. Um, so text mining is actually what Wikipedia has sort of resolved text analysis to in the way that we're talking about it. Um, and I kind of like that, you know, that text mining is something that we think about like data mining, right? Like it's a computer term. Um, so deriving high quality information from the text. I think that's really key. You can derive all kinds of information from text. The question is, how do you get the high quality information out of the text? Um, and so it usually involves a process of structuring the input text. And this is something I can't stress enough if you're new to this, is that a lot of people think, oh, I can just throw a set of texts at this algorithm and it's gonna give me instant results. And one of the things we all talk about at conferences is actually how long we spend cleaning our text so that it's ready to go. And I'll show you some examples of why that matters in a minute. Um, so usually there's some structuring of the text and some parsing um, and also sort of removal of some of the words that you might not want to study. Um, I'm assuming none of you here are scholars of the word the. Um, so when we go in and we look at these things, that's usually, you know, those are there's a list of soft words that gets rid of words like that unless you're looking at function words, and then <laughs> we keep them all in. Um, so, what's it good for? Well, so here's an example. This is actually from Hamlet, um, and this is just a really basic frequency chart, okay? It shows you the top 10 words and how often they're used. And look at the use of the word Lord. It's like, oh, like it's, you know, more than twice as much as like, the has been like runner up here. So clearly there's something going on with it. And I'm like, well, what is going on with it? So I then had David generate a table for me of what happens around the word lowered. This is called keyword in context. Um, and he got the word good. Now, why is that slightly different than what you're seeing below? It's because I used a stop word list to generate the one on top. So the word my is no longer part of it, but that's one of those ones which I'll talk about in a second. You might want to know that they're saying my Lord. Um, and that may be that you put the pronouns back in because you think they're important. So it's sometimes helpful to look at it two different ways. So why is this important? Because the good Lord and the my Lord, that's basically the equivalent, the Shakespearean equivalent if I'm being polite, of, hey, what's up? Do I want to study that? Probably not. So it may be that for me, the word Lord, unless I'm looking at form formalisms in this play, that I throw it out. Because it's going to skew everything else. And so that's why starting with some of these simple algorithms helps you iterate through for later use. So this is something, this is sort of a preview of next week. Um, this is topic bottling with word clouds. Um, I will admit, I used to be a word cloud snob. Um, there was a time in the mid 2000s, which is rapidly becoming like a long time ago, when people would come to the DH conference and they'd put up a Wordle and they'd be like, I do DH. And I'd be like, no, like that in and of itself is not like DH, right? So but here, these are topic models where each topic is visualized in a word cloud. And the reason that I, I like this is because I get to see frequency and parse it really quickly with my eyes. That's what a word cloud does for you. It's an easier way for you to detect frequency. So I call the first word cloud my man cloud. 
because um, it's got man, men, right? So this is like the cloud about dudes. And obviously Shakespeare writes a lot about dudes. And then I think it's also really interesting, um, notice how gold and power really factor into this topic, as do the gods. So I think it's really interesting that he is, those are, he's talking about some of those big power structures and it's very clearly that they come, it's very clear that they come out here. So I was like, well, are there any women here? Um, and there is one, where'd she go? Oh, right, right here. Here we are, ladies. That's right. The top associated sort of female word here is witch. I was like, really? Really, Shakespeare? Because like, I like him. And I thought he was, you know, there's some strong female characters. Um, and so I thought, maybe I'm looking at a difference in early modern spelling. Because we're using the Folger Shakespeare libraries collection of early modern plays. And the reason it's super awesome is one, it's the Folger Shakespeare editions, right? So they're, they're standardized. Two, they are the current head, Michael Whitmore, is a digital scholar. And so they have both the complete plays with all of the enters and exit and speaker names. And then they have a clean set where all the speaker names are taken out, which is super duper important. Because if I were to look at Hamlet, where every time Hamlet talked, which is a lot, then it said Hamlet, to be or not to be, blah, 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 blah. Hamlet, da, da, da. I would have that same thing that happened with Lord, right? And it would just prove to me, like, of course, what I already know, right? That Hamlet is the star of the show. So I don't want those speaker names because those are false frequency hits. Um, and one of the popular tools, there is an introduction to Voyant um, later this semester by our friends at Ida. Um, but one of their corpora is Shakespeare's plays. And they left the speaker names in for readability. And you can see it in their word cloud that shows up for the corpus as just a sample corpus with Henry because there are nine million Henry plays, right? There's Henry the Fourth, part one and two. There's Henry the Fifth. There's all the Henry the Sixth, like all the ones that nobody reads except for Henry the Fifth. But it means that every time Henry talks in any of those plays, it shows up as a word count. And it makes that top list. So I was like, okay, is this witch right? Like, is it really there? Um, and we can also, you know, there's family stuff going on. Um, so I then went into a tool called AntConc, which is another sort of off the shelf. You can run this on your computer. And I was like, what's the situation with witch? And I was like, oh, yeah, it is, it is witches. It's not a like different spelling of W-H-I-C-H. Like, yeah. And there's awful bad damn sor sorceress, um, the witch, fa the foul and ugly, right? Like, and some of them are actual witches. Um, in some of the more fantastical plays, and others are here when they talk about turning into a witch or acting like a witch, or so yeah, there we are. So that's one example. Um, I don't know. I should actually go search the MLA bibliography to see if somebody has written about Shakespeare's attitude towards women as witches, et cetera, and the fact that you know I I, I don't know. Um, so it's important to many fields, though, um, is we interrogate reams of data. So I've just given you literary examples. Sorry about that. Um, sorry, not sorry. Um, but I also study uh, social media and some of the trends there. Um, Twitter is actually a better source than Facebook unless you're studying public figures. We have someone who's come to us who actually has been scraping um, the Facebook public figure pages. Um, so you go to Donald Trump's page, you scrape all those public entries, right? Because I think Facebook is just more locked down on private users. But anything that anybody posts there is open. And then looking at likes, right? And who likes and what, how many comments a certain post will get. Clearly, um, Twitter also allows for this, right? And I think that now more than ever, because of the fact that Trump tweets all the time, um, there's a lot we can do. And you've probably already seen the memes that came out of this weekend and Hamburger. Um, Burger King actually tweeted, the official Burger King tweeted yesterday that we don't serve hamburgers, but we are, or we're all out of hamburgers, but we are going to be serving hamburgers all day. So, um, yes. Um, so you can use it on, we've also used it on articles like that you can download from JSTOR or PubMed or Science Direct, um, manuscripts, monographs, 
poetry, that's a whole other thing. We can talk about it. It works. Although some of the ways in which it breaks because of poetic language is actually really fascinating. Um, legal documents and then social media. And you don't have to do a huge collection. So just because we have like millions of tweets that we collected about North Korea doesn't mean you have to start with a corpus that big. Um, in fact, I often recommend starting small, like with Hamlet. So I taught high school for five years and I taught Shakespeare. And so I taught, Ham taught Hamlet five times a day sometimes, right, for those five years. So I do still love it, which is kind of amazing. Like I never want to read the Scarlet Letter ever again. <laughs> um, but I'm totally happy to reread Hamlet. So I think that's also like, you know, like what's stuck with me. Um, but so then I, I have this sense of what's going on here. And so if something shows up and I'm like, oh, I don't understand, at least I already have this, I have an intimate knowledge of that text. So then when I throw the whole Shakespearean corpus, like even though I was supposed to have read all of them for quals, like I don't remember all the Henry ads. Like I didn't like them, um, you know. So then, like the history plays are not my favorite, and so I can be like, oh, okay, I know this works. Or if I want to broaden it out to a whole bunch of early modern playwrights, right? Oop, yeah. So we talk about um, getting rid of stop words. Um, there are a lot of stop word lists out there. Um, and some of what you're going to see are differences in the way that Python implements stop word lists and R. Um, the text mining package, it's called TM and R, actually gives you some options in English that in Python you have to use the NLTK list. And so they're slightly different, which means you get slightly different results. And it's just good to be aware of it. Um, even when we downloaded um, an early modern stop word list, also from the folder, I think I was really surprised thou was still in there. And again, if we're talking about no miser in there, then thou shouldn't be in there either. Um, so again, being consistent in what you take out. If I take out one pronoun, I should take them all out. Um, and then also preparing the text for information retrieval. We do this in our scripts. Um, we lowercase everything. So why would I do that? So if I have, I'm going to the lake this weekend to swim with my friends, Lake Geneva is really interesting, and I want those two lakes to both be counted as lake something. Yeah. No, I actually take away the proper name. I make them all lowercase. Yeah, so I make them all lowercase so that they count, because I do want to aggregate all those lakes, no matter where they come in the sentence. So when you see results, you're going to see all these lower cases. The other thing I, I get rid of is I, t I get rid of punctuation. So there would be a way that you could probably add in spaces if you were counting commas or something. Um, again, for me and Shakespeare, all those commas are added after the fact. That's not something that Shakespeare wrote down. Um, in James Joyce, however, those commas are so important. Like I've seen whole panels about like where a period was supposed to go in like Dubliners and I'm like oh my god can I just like leave now <laughs> um, but for them like punctuation study is really important so again it just depends on like your corpus um, Twitter is one where what if if I'm me right in my 40s and I'm like I hate Donald Trump I'm probably gonna type h-a-t-e if I'm 18 I might type H8. And so there, that's one of the other things is you want to then collapse those. You want to say H8 is the same thing as H-A-T-E. Unless, again, I'm studying like differences in users, and I think I can predict some stuff. So again, you want to think about what's your end use. And you may count them both separately initially, and then collapse them back together. Um, and like I said, the misspellings in Trump's tweets sometimes make it hard for us. Um, also, his lexicon makes it hard for us. Midway through the election, Hol Access Hollywood tapes came out, and I had to add all kinds of vulgar words for the female genitalia, because they weren't in any of the lists, right, for sentiment analysis. And I'm like, OK, I get to do a survey of all the words that are flying around out there. Um, 
So also we get rid of like white space, stuff like that. Um, so um, topic modeling, um, so LDA, latent semantic analysis, word to vec, those are all ways you can sort of do topic modeling. Um, and here it's actually taking words, all the words in the text. And then it starts sorting, and initially it just puts them all in bags. And then it refines it, it iterates over it, until if you've got a text that's mostly about like cats and dogs. All of the words about cats, like meow, and um, milk, and super independent, and bossy <laughs> are gonna end up with cats, right? And then all the like best friend, dog, like woof, like all that kind of stuff are probably gonna end up with dog because they tend to happen in similar contexts. And then maybe I'll find out there's some interesting like conjunction or other topic that like I can't tell if it's a cat or a dog. I don't know. Which would be my dog, who's a cat. <laughs> um, and then finally, sentiment analysis, like I said, is actually there's whole companies around this, right? That will do sentiment analysis professionally around your brand, your product, um, even doing you know political trends, which is the one that I'm most interested in. Um, so this is like people out in the world making lots of money. So let's make some word clouds. Um, like I said, they provide us with a quick way for you to visually parse frequency. For example, if I give you this, again, you can see Lord up here, and you can see the difference, and you can see this other stuff happening, or you can look at the word cloud. And it's actually easier to look at all of that conjunction of lots of words super quickly. So again, that we've got this king and father, which I, I would expect, right? Like this is a play, despite the fact that the father is dead, when the play begins. It's there enough, right, 70 times. And one of the other things I used to show is actually it occurs more times in Hamlet than it does in King Lear, where King Lear's whole definition of himself is as a father to his three children, his three daughters. And yet in Hamlet, the dad's dead, but Hamlet is obsessed about that, right? And Gertrude is obsessed over it. And Ophelia is obsessed about what her father is trying to make her do to Hamlet, right? So all of these father relationships are really important to the play. Oh, back. Um, so this is an n-gram word cloud. Um, so this is an n-gram simply means you can put any letter, letter, you put any number in where n is. So maybe a phrase is important to you. Maybe we do want to put my back in and then we want to look at my Lord. Um, so you might notice here I've switched modes a little bit. Um, so we started looking at Star Trek The Next Generation, but not completely because the lead actor, um, Captain Picard, played by Patrick Stewart, um, is a Shakespeare, he's a trained Shakespearean actor, <laughs> right? So he, he worked and he did Shakespeare for forever and ever and ever, which is actually part of the reason that they, even though Gene Roddenberry has always said that he was influenced by Shakespeare, that they wrote that into Picard's character and why he's always sort of referring to Shakespeare. And there are more references in this than in any of the other sort of flavors of Star Trek that are out there. So we did this initially and actually what you see is you see Mr. Data, Commander Riker, Captain Picard, Lieutenant Yar, um, and I'm like, oh, I pro yeah, like those are not so helpful because they're character names that I'm like, eh, you know, other than like going like, yes, I know like most of this is like focused around there. It is interesting that Lieutenant Yar is here. Um, is this just the first season? Oh, that's why I was like, because Tasha dies. So um, we sat down and rewatched the whole series for research. Um, <laughs> um, so Mr. LaForge, et cetera. So the, I would probably get rid of them if I'm not interested in, because we've gotten rid of all the speaker names already, but if I'm also just not interested in like how that happens other than the fact that I know that they're talking to them most often. Um, and then David got really fancy for us, and this is the Python version. And I think it's interesting that number one shows up over here, but you're, a little more obviously, I'm sure it's here too. Um, Captain Picard is in the shape of, obviously, a rocket ship. So if you want to have a little bit of fun with your word clouds. Oh, 
Oh, so one is gone. And knowing your corpus and knowing that like Captain Picard calls Riker, right? Number one, most of the time. And so you're like, oh my God, where is that? I do love that tractor beam is in there as well. And I'm, cause then I'm like, ooh, do we need to go to like Star Wars? Like, you know, what's the, what's the, like, we can see the different like um, science fiction universes like impacting one another. And also that yes captain is there. Cause of course that's what you're supposed to say to your captain. You don't say no captain, you say yes captain. Um, this one, I'm still not, I'm on the fence about this visualization. You can vote or not. So this is actually from the shooting that happened in Parkland um, almost a year ago. And afterwards, um, March for Our Lives was the hashtag um, that most of them used. But you can sort of see like different change. Midterm elections is in here somewhere. So I was like, yeah, right? Like we all knew like that was possibly coming. Um, and also these students really I stood up, right? and talked about what happened um, and made waves, right? They went to Washington and they were really apparent on social media and they talked, they gave public speeches all over Florida in ways that at some of the other tragedies, it hadn't happened, right? And I know when I remember Columbine happening when I was teaching, we didn't have Twitter, right? We didn't have Facebook. So all they did, you know, they basically made it so we could pull the blinds down in all our rooms. They did come back, so our school changed, but okay. Um, and so we're gonna talk about stream graphs and then we're gonna go into red. And I apologize if, yeah, let's see where we are. Okay, so what is a stream graph? Um, it sounds pretty and it is pretty. Um, so it allows you to see word frequency linearly across a corpus. So if that's across the space of a book, great. Although I just finished N.K. Jemison's um, first book in um, the fifth season, where every you've got all these different narrators, and actually it's not a linear progression across time. So I could see how words are being used across the book, but it represents in no way does it represent linear time. But if I'm doing it on tweets or I'm doing it on articles, stuff like that, it could be really helpful. Um, so here, um, these, this is the last episode of Star Trek. Um, and so we have segments of 250 words. And we have anomaly, captain, and time. Um, and that's because, if you remember, what's going on is there's all these time shifts. And so you can see how they all interplay with one another. Now, if you look at the two, the R and the Python, um, they're different. And again, this is because of the stop word list and R and Python are different. And I don't have a recommendation as to which is better, but um, I do know that they're not that long. And even though it sounds really boring, I would read your stop word list to see what's in it. So the fact that David knew that one was getting eliminated from all the R stuff and not from Python, right? And this is, like I said, this is the stuff as you get more experience or if you've got one of us helping you, you can always ask us for a consultation. Um, that this is the kind of stuff we could say, oh, there might be this pitfall, because we've run into it um, more than likely. So actually what I wanna go back to, so what we should do now is go to the desktop. Go away, go away. And actually, do you wanna log into Red and talk us through um, one of the basic ones? Why don't you just do like a basic plain text word cloud in R and then show us Python or show us Python and then R? You guys have a preference? Oh, right, I'm still talking. Yay. So we need to, again, remember the server, we need to change the name there. Um, that's gonna be red.uich.iu.edu. And I'm gonna log into my, did we load this on already on CyberDH or should I just, 
Okay, so I'm gonna since you got I'm gonna do mine just so we don't have to wait five minutes for this to load. And just click continue, it's fine. This is where I'm going to click one. Got my my phone ready here. Maybe. Okay, I'm going to guess that's not. There we go. All right. And here we are. And you can see I already had stuff up um, from before. So we. I'll close this out. And so I'll show you instead of doing it on the desktop, I'll do it so you guys can see when you first start, go to applications, analytics, Jupyter notebook. Okay. Now you can also, while that's loading, you don't have to hit that okay, it'll disappear on its own, but you can if you want. Um, you can also, if you want to pin it, if you right click when you're on it, it gives you an option. Except since mine, you, know, you can add this launcher to desktop, and then that's how it'll pin right there for you when you first log on. Um, and you can do the same thing for box um, when you're starting with that. So storage, box setup, I right click, add this so that when I first load up, I don't have to go up there anymore for the important things. That's why I have Jupyter Notebook R Studio and my box thing all pinned to my desktop right there because I know I'm going to use them a lot. And it just saves me precious seconds. Um, so it opens and we are here. You can see it opens up and gives you access right away. To your home directory so that close out is home. It's every folder I have in there. So the one I'm interested in right now is here. The one that you guys should have loaded intro text analysis. And you see now I've got, so they all end. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks will all end in the .ipynb, and that just stands for IPython Notebook. Um, and so that's how you're going to know what your notebooks are. So if you have this, if you're completely disorganized and you have notebooks mixed with regular just scripts, um, Python scripts will end in a .py file extension, and R ends in .r. Um, but that's how you can differentiate, especially if you've otherwise named them the same. Um, I tried to help you guys out by putting a dash py and dash r at the end too, because I know not everybody, it sh doesn't always show the extension. A lot of people like to hide them, um, but this way you know what you're getting into. So we'll start first. Um, why don't we do word cloud? Okay, word cloud plain text Python. We open it and you can see here it opens in a tab and that's what's going to happen. You can have multiple notebooks open. And it's just going to put another tab up here. So it opens in your browser, but it's not, not, it's not like connecting to a server or anything. It is opening and connected to your desktop. But it just uses the browser as an interface. Um, and so we can now see it has all these annotations. I go, we go through and explain what these packages are. So this is what we're talking about, NLTK, Corpus Import Stop Words. So this is NLTK Stop Word List. Now, one of the nice things about NLTK that's different from R is that you can actually create your own and put it in their data file where they store all the stop words. You just name it, a, a name like if I wanted to do a Latin one, I would just name it Latin, save it in there, and then when I want to call it later, um, I can actually call my own stop word list where it says English here. I just type Latin instead. Currently, it doesn't come with a Latin stop word list. This is how you can kind of add your own to the NLTK um, without having to then call later, farther down, um, add an addendum one, um, which makes it easy. And then you can also add additional words. So you can see good, come, would. Uh, now these are going to be considered stop words. Adding them, it's extending the stop word list, dot extent. How it's kind of it reads like English. It makes sense. Stop words dot extend. I'm extending the stop word list with those words in the, in the um, parentheses and brackets. So, so 
if you want to just run the whole code, all you have to, yeah. Um, so what we have here, and I explain, we I keep saying I, sorry. I've done a lot of work on these. <laughs> um, so I'm explaining a little bit what a function is. So when you use def, you're declaring a function. And I'm saying I want to name my function text clean. And when I use it, I have all of these arguments that need to be met in order for it to work. And they are a text and a stop word list. And when it says equals none, that means if I don't put anything, this is the default. So I could put just a text. And if I don't put stop word list, it's going to just assume that I don't have one and that's okay. If that's going to be the default. So I have to put something in there for it to actually do something. You can make that, you can make some of these defaults different. You can make them numbers. So no matter what, if you don't put anything, it's always going to be two. Um, it just depends on what it is that you're doing. But what a function does is basically then it does everything that comes after it that's indented in Python. So it's going to go through now. And instead of me having to do a different step for each of these, and do it to my script over and over again. All I have to do now is call that one thing. I put text clean, whatever variable I've named my text that I've brought in, and it's gonna go through and do all of this to it. So they're very handy, they're very useful. It makes it easier later on. And it can be reused. Um, as you'll see, you'll probably see when we pull up some other ones, you'll be like, that, that clean text Function looks familiar. That's because I just copied and pasted it over. And uh, uh, shout out to uh, another guy, Guan Chen, um, that works with us. Helped a lot with these as well. Uh, so a lot of this is his. And I really don't like that I can't see the mouse pointer. There we go. Good night. <laughs> so then there's another function. And this is the one that's going to tell how to plot the actual word cloud when we get to it. So you can see it's um, one, this mask thing, this is what makes it take that nice shape of the USS Enterprise. Um, you can pull in an actual image and I recommend there's a place called Free Stencil Gallery and it's actually stencils and the more contrast there is, the better because what it's gonna actually do is anything that isn't absolute white, it's going to put in there. Now there's other ways you can actually color it then based on the color of the image. So if you have a color image that's on a white background, it'll act, you can actually color it to match the colors in the image. Um, I didn't get that fancy, but um, that is a possibility. And now we're creating functions to draw a word cloud from a single text. So this is if we just have one text file that we're pulling in, or we can draw it from scan, which is an entire corpus. So if I have a whole bunch of text files that are maybe individual chapters in a book or one author's works like Shakespeare, we have each of his individual plays or individual episodes of Star Trek. Um, it'll pull all of those in and, um, and read through them and then you can do the word cloud on that. Um, so here, this is where you're gonna need to make changes Specifically, where it says close setup, put your username. Everything else then should work fine if you've pulled in that folder. But anytime you see a path, so this is just a file path, and it's pointing to this folder called series. And then when we go down here, we're connecting it. So see how we named it corpus root? We're joining that to the actual name of a single text file. So this is actually the first episode. Um, it was actually 102.txt, so this is the, the far point one for those of you that are super nerdy and geeky too, um, and watched Star Trek for research. Um, so, and then again, anytime you see file tabs, just plop, change that out. Uh, otherwise, it's going to show an error because it's going to say, I don't know where this close data folder is that you're speaking of. And you can see one of the results. So if you notice, that is the Star Trek emblem, the you know, command insignia that they all wear. And then, so the first one is just from the single episode. So this is from episode 102. Hmm? 
Yeah, so you just have to change again here and here. And then when we go down, you'll have to change again. Because um, this is for one text, and then this one down here calls in the entire uh, folder that contains um, the entire series. So we'll scroll down. You can see it lets you know when it's done with a text, which is helpful, but if you have a ton of them, you may want to um, turn that off. I'll show you where, and then you can see, you can see it's a bit more filled in, partially because it has a lot more words to work with. Um, so there's more unique uh, that are now filling this in. Whereas before, it can only have so many when it's just single episodes. So. Um, but on this, there's two ways you can do this. Um, well, there's actually more than two, but there's two that I would recommend. The first is if you're really just dying to see Run it all at once, go up to cell right here, and you can just click run all. So we'll try that. Down. So now you see it has these little asks and this in in between the brackets. But you know that it's still thinking, it's still processing what you um, and you'll if you go up there next to each and every one. When it's done, you'll see a number pop up in there that tells you that it is done with that step in the code. Um, if you're down here at the bottom and you're just kind of waiting for your text, your uh, word cloud to pop up and all of a sudden that disappears with no number, that lets you know that there's an error up there somewhere. It didn't like something. Um, and the nice thing too, and we might change something to purposefully do an error here next, so you can kind of see what it looks like. And again, the nice thing is it lets you know where your error is then. So you're not going through, looking through a big old long thing of code going, Okay, I understand you don't like this, but I have no idea where in the code the problem is. Um, you know that it's at least here, or possibly it didn't agree with something that was done above, but at least now you've narrowed it down. So you can see how there's a seven there now. So it's going through this one. Still thinking about that. Uh, And when it's done, it'll basically pop that up. It'll look a little different because it doesn't always put them in the exact same location. Uh, the size generally stays the same. So that's part of the thing with the word cloud too is the bigger the word, the more frequently it's occurring. Uh, and they try to group ones that have a similar frequency by color as well. So, but as you can tell, since there's only, um, we're using something called dark too. So there's only, I think eight color options. So once it gets to a certain point, it just recycles and goes back to that color, but it's now a smaller text. So um, that's why you might see like, oh, look, it's gold. And so is that little tiny one there. That's because it went back through and reused it. So that is the final one. And then it looks like this one's done now. And so we run it all. And we've got our word cloud again. Now the other way to do it, and this is if you're really just trying to, to test one part of it, is you actually can highlight the cell, if I can find my mouse pointer again, there we go. You highlight it, and then you hit shift return, and it'll run that. See how it changed to 10? Because we ended at nine before at the bottom, so it just keeps going in order unless you close this out and start it over, or you can even go up here and go to kernel and restart it. And sometimes you want to do that because certain things in your code, if you've made lots of changes, it sometimes still it has things in the environment from your old code. And so you run something and you go, oh, it works, great. And then you go do something, you come back, you close it, you run it again, you're like, oh, it's broken. Why is it broken? Well, because whatever you did to change it, it was remembering something from before and still running it. So it's good to just restart the kernel every now and then, because that eliminate, it kind of wipes out the environment and starts you over again. Um, so anytime you make a change, I always recommend you save, save, you can restart or hit restart and run all. So. Um, so you can see it did that. And then if I want, I can just keep doing that. I can just keep going through shift return, 
shift return. You see it thinks, pops up the shift return. And the functions generally don't think too much because you're kind of just saying, hey, this is, keep this in mind. Um, so it's not actually processing anything yet. So why don't we try something where we're going to pop up an error. So I'm going to change and to show you just how finicky it can be. And this, I spent an hour and a half wondering why it couldn't find my file yesterday because that little slash in the beginning was missing and I didn't see it. So now if I run this, it's going to tell me when I get down here and actually try to do something to it, it's going to tell me that it can't find, see, file not found. And it's going to say, see, there's no such file or directory. And for some reason, I did not notice that that slash was missing when that popped up 20 times. Um, but that's how, that's how minimal an error can be. It can be just something just that simple. Um, but so let's go back up and fix that. Though. Um, so one of the reasons we've done this is that basically it's a gap, right? So all you have to do is just put your text in a folder, your text, mm -hmm. and then just change that in your code, um, and then adjust it for what you need. So like yeah. maybe you don't want 500 words, yeah. you know, maybe you only want 250. So we'll change it to that, 250. And just run that cell. And then... I need to go back up and rerun the one that had the miss thing first because it's still going to remember. Since I haven't run that again since I fixed it, it's going to still remember that that slash is missing. So if I just reran that cell without going back up and putting that back in corrected, it would still give me that error. But I've changed it to 250, so we'll run it. You can see now that the output's gone because it's thinking. Um, and since this is only one episode. It should not take too, too long. Um, but you'll notice then that the word cloud is going to be a bit sparser because we're only doing um, 250 words. So in that case, again, that might be then like, you know what, I don't want to use a mask because I really only want to see those 250 words. And you know, as cutesy as that shape is, it really isn't what I'm here for. Um, so there we go. You can see how it is a bit sparser, a little harder to make out what it is, because uh, we're only doing 250. Okay. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them through the chat, and Katie can relay them. Um, but I think we're sort of going to wrap up here. I know we've sort of just thrown a lot at you. Please feel free to make an appointment and we can sit down and go over stuff with you. And um, actually, I don't know how much I'm allowed to reveal, but I was reviewing for the Digital Humanities Conference, our international conference this year. And I actually, one of the reviews that I was looking at was Shakespearean influences on Star Trek. I kid you not. So clearly, <laughs> there's an academic somewhere who was like, this is what I want to do. Um, so they were looking at basically this cross, um, what they sort of call this intertextuality, right, between the two. Um, and if you do literary studies at all, you can talk about Harold Bloom or other things, but you know, this is where you, this is an easy way to sort of do, use machine learning to sort of do it. Um, so does anybody here have any questions? Oh, no, so we can make that with you today. We can just set up a time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, and also, so we have some reviews or surveys to hand out. So ways that you think this could be improved or whatever. This is our first time teaching with Jupyter Notebooks. You might have noticed. <laughs> and we wanted to explain enough, but maybe we over-explained. So, you know, we, we certainly welcome your feedback. But thanks for coming.